This question is from Lucas who says, I've been watching your series since some time now and I really like the way you handle topics and speak the truth. Perhaps one thing that my mind is considered of is the self-defense. My question is, should we defend ourselves physically using our strength or weapons. My question comes from the fact that Jesus said on the one side that we should love our enemies and pray for those who prosecute us. And on the other side, elsewhere, he told his disciples to take swords with them. To me, these two fragments are very contradictory and I can't think of proper circumstances to when apply self-defense and when not to. Could you tell me what you think about that? Sorry for my probably bad English. Now your English is great. I understood that perfectly. And I think this is a very interesting topic that you've raised. And I think it's very wide ranging as well. As I've been considering how to talk about this, I thought I should maybe even make a mini series about this because there are just so many different angles to consider here. I think how you respond to a physical threat changes depending on the ages of the people involved, whether they're male or female, whether the threat is lethal or non-lethal, whether it's during peacetime or war, whether it's the police or army, or whether it's a private citizen, whether it's persecution for being a Christian or for some other reason, whether there's intoxication or drugs involved, there's just all these different combinations and permutations to consider. And I think each one would slightly change and alter how we would respond to that particular situation. And it's difficult to cover all these different combinations in just one video. However, I've been trying to consider, is there a single biblical, easy to understand rule of thumb principle, which you can carry with you throughout your life and which applies to all situations? And I think there is. And this is what I'm gonna to try to present in this video, just a single overarching, easy to understand principle, which applies to every situation. First of all, let me establish the kind of person that a Christian is supposed to be. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So if you're a Christian with the Holy Spirit in you, these are the traits that you should be increasingly exhibiting as you're sanctified throughout your life. You should be loving people. Jesus said, yes, even love your enemies. We should be joyful and good natured. We should be a delight to be around, basically. We should be living peaceful lives. The Bible says to make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. We should be patient when provoked, long suffering. We should be kind, good, faithful and gentle and we should be self-controlled as well. So if someone insults you, Jesus says to turn the other cheek, don't retaliate, don't pay back evil for evil, forgive those who slight you. We've been talking just a few episodes back about the need to absorb the cost of forgiveness. The Bible also says to rejoice when you're persecuted for being a Christian. So all of these verses and many more paint a very clear picture of the kind of person a Christian is supposed to be. However, all that being said, the Bible does create space for self-defense. In Exodus, it says, if a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is struck and killed in the process, the person who killed the thief is not guilty of murder. But if it happens in daylight, the one who killed the thief is guilty of murder. This is an old covenant law and something that we've been doing a lot of in the season of answers videos is saying, okay, that was the letter of the law for the old covenant period. How do we now translate that into the new covenant period? What is the spirit of this law? What is the message, the underlying message behind this law? What is God trying to communicate? And the spirit of this law is firstly saying that you've got a right to private property. So take that, you communists. But it's also saying that you've got a right to defend that property. And more pertinently, you've got a right to defend the innocent people within that property. An intruder at night is something of an ambush. You're asleep, you're in a vulnerable state because you're in your PJs or even possibly naked. There's confusion, it's dark, you can't see who this is. You don't know the extent of their evil intentions. You don't have time to have a conversation to figure it out. You don't know if they've got a weapon or not. And the Bible says that in such moments, you are within your rights to do whatever is necessary to protect yourself and your family. Yes, even to the point of using lethal force. You're not expected to just sit there and let this guy rape your wives and daughters and kill you and your kids. The Bible says, go take that person out, deal with the situation. It's the right thing to do, and it won't be held against you. You are not guilty of murder. You must do what is necessary to protect the innocent in your household. I guess I'm talking especially to men here because this is primarily your job to put your life on the line to protect your family. But then this passage interestingly talks about daylight making a difference. So you ask yourself, what difference does daylight make? And I think this is what 
the message of this passage is saying. I think this is the difference that daylight makes. In daylight, you're awake, you're alert. You can possibly see this person approaching from quite a distance away. You can look them in the eye. You probably have time to talk to them. You can reason with them. You have a lot more opportunity to avoid violence and bloodshed. And if that opportunity exists in any way whatsoever, I think the principle is that you should always take it. Your first instinct should always be to de-escalate, avoid harm, and resolve situations peacefully. Make every effort to live in peace. That's what I think the daylight changes. If you have the chance to look that person in the eye and do it peacefully, then do it peacefully. Indeed, exhaust every possible opportunity before turning to physical force. Physical force should always be an absolute last resort. So this is the overarching principle, really, I think. Love people, live in peace with them at all times. If you have a chance to de-escalate a situation peacefully, then do it. But if it's not possible, you have permission to do whatever is necessary to end that threat. So let's put this into a real life context for a moment. Let's say that you're going about your business and you're living in peace and you're showing love and kindness to everyone. You're just having a good time. You're living a joyful life. When a terrorist attack happens on the street, a guy starts roaming about with a knife. He starts randomly killing people. He starts knifing innocent people on the street. The biblical response, the spirit of this Exodus law, I think is, If you have a chance to look that person in the eye and de-escalate that situation peacefully, then do it. If you can talk to the guy, if you can reason with him, do it. However, often in these situations, that option just doesn't exist. And in such cases, as a last resort, you need to use physical force to save the lives of the innocent and end that threat. And the Bible gives you permission to do that. The Bible frequently calls us to protect the weak and vulnerable. And in some cases, protecting the weak and vulnerable means defending them against violence. It's regrettable if you have to stop a person using physical force. It's regrettable. But it would be far more regrettable if that terrorist continued walking around taking the lives of innocent people. You would become an accomplice to terror if you just stood back and let him continue knifing people on the street. That would be a cowardly response. The Bible says if you can do it peacefully, then do it. But if not, then do what it takes to defend yourself, your family, and the lives of innocents, and it won't be held against you. When Nehemiah was building the walls of Jerusalem, there was a constant threat of attack from invaders, so they actually designated half of the men to build the walls, while the other half were designated to protect those construction workers as they worked. He says, half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. These people were building their wall. They were going about their lives in peace. They were not looking for violence, but if they were attacked, they did have permission to defend themselves against those invaders. Something that you alluded to in your message, Lucas, is how there appears to be a contradiction in saying love your enemies on one hand, but then also carry a sword on the other hand and not knowing when to apply which one. But maybe I can put it like this. I don't know if this is a universal thing or if this just exists in the English speaking world, but here we have a phrase, a modern proverb, I guess you could call it, which is strike while the iron's hot. And it simply means act quickly, act decisively, get in there fast. But then we also have another phrase, which is fools rush in, which means the complete opposite. It means be cautious, don't be too hasty, hang back a little bit. Now these things are both considered to be wise and yet they're completely contradictory. Another way of putting this is the early bird gets the worm, but the late mouse gets the cheese. So what should you do? Should you get in early or should you stay back? One phrase says one thing, another phrase says the other thing. But this is where we need wisdom. Wisdom tells you when to apply one and when to apply the other. Both are true, but wisdom gives you the judgment or the discernment to know when to apply one and when to apply the other. Wisdom means having the power of discernment, judgment, or discretion. So in every situation that arises, you're gonna need to use some sort of discretion or discernment. Is there a chance to resolve the situation peacefully? If there is, I'll take it or Do I need to use force here? Sometimes it'll be one, sometimes it'll be the other. A guy breaks into your house at night, you don't have time to have a conversation with him, you don't know his evil intentions, the likelihood is you're gonna have to just go take him out. 
A guy starts getting abusive in broad daylight though, maybe you can extract yourself from that situation in a peaceful way, talk him down, alert a police officer, walk away, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, but the core principle that I'll come back to is number one, love everyone and make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Number two, when you're attacked, make every effort to resolve that situation peacefully. But number three, as a last resort, there is permission to use force to save your life, your family's lives, and to protect the lives of innocent people. There's a lot more to say about this. Maybe I've rushed a bit too quickly and maybe I've thrown up more questions than answers on this one. I guess ideally I'd have liked to talk about the difference between retaliation and self-defense. Retaliation is never an option for Christians as we were talking about in the forgiveness video. Retaliation is acting out of vengeful malice or spite, whereas self-defense is simply doing whatever is necessary to create safety to protect innocent lives. There's no malice or vengeance involved in self-defense. It's simply creating safety for the innocent. I'd also like to talk about how the Bible differentiates between killing and murder. In fact, maybe I'll do that in the next video, but I think the next video is going to be the last one of this answers run. And I don't particularly want the last video to be about killing and murder. So I don't know. But Yes, the broad principle. Number one, love and live in peace with everyone. Number two, if you're attacked, use all possible methods to get a peaceful resolution and avoid violence and bloodshed. But then number three, as an absolute last resort, if your innocent people are in danger, you're allowed to do whatever it takes to bring that situation to an end, to end that threat and to restore peace and to make people safe again.